My topic for tonight is titled, To Be Seen. I have a love-hate relationship with this word. I love to get it, but I hate when I don't. I'm reminded of the time when I was studying at Tux in Pretoria. I was majoring in philosophy. And for those who have never done philosophy or understand it, it's probably the hardest thing to do. It's a very thought-provoking, very anti-God, and sometimes very for God. The goal is to ask questions until you reach the point of enlightenment. In first year, you start off with ancient Greece philosophy, from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle. Then second year, it gets all hectic. You learn about moral law, reason, utilitarian theory, master-slave contract. What does it mean to be an entity in the world? I think, therefore, I am, just to name a few. But what stuck out to me the most was this one statement we would write tons of essays about. And that was the word recognition. And the big word, unrecognized. In a philosophical note, unrecognized means to not even exist. To the point of being considered under a slave, below, invisible, unseen. This is where it became apparent to me as alarm bells were ringing in my head. Damn, I struggle with this. And just like me, many of us have aspects in our lives where we feel unseen, unheard, and forgotten. So I hope my word tonight really hits those alarm bells, and I pray to break that off. Amen? Throughout the ages, the need to feel seen has been a crucial part of our human existence. What might sound simple, like here I am standing in front of you, I see you and you see me. Being seen entails a cascade of other acknowledgements, such as trust, acceptance, understanding, love, respect, and a sense of belonging, all good things. So why is this important? And what does this mean to us? Feeling seen is a state in which a part or parts of identity, emotions, or physical presence get fully recognized through various means, such as representation, validation, support, and inclusion. When we're not being seen, we can wind up feeling misunderstood, neglected, or ostracized by others. That is why we see so many movements out there in the world trying to demonstrate the need to feel seen. Although there might be an opposition to God's word, the roots of the pain is still there. While it's not often noticed, feeling seen by others can be an incredibly empowering experience. The recognition of various parts of our being helps us to feel connected to others, less isolated and more understood. Being seen allows others to help us and vice versa. Let's go and have some water quick. Mm. So how do we make each other seen and invisible? It comes by two points. Accidentally doing it, or doing it on purpose. Surprisingly, it's quite easy for one of us to hurt another. As the saying goes, hurt people, hurt people. And a lot of people are hurting, thereby leaving others feeling less seen. We do this in everyday conversation. When we misconstruct what is said to us, prevent someone else from expressing themselves, or refusing to take someone else seriously, It can also happen when we don't ask people how they're doing or if they need anything from us or what's going through their minds. Basically, it's a lot of drama that goes in our heads, but it points to the heart.
We live in a world of social media and great technology innovations that connect us like never before. On the surface, this is all well and good, but it generates new forms of alienation with the paving of every new road that could connect us to someone or something, another path follows, which leaves us more empty. This might come from not receiving enough engagement on our social media content, infrequent responses from others, or insignificant conversations that do not meet our needs. We have lost our ability to form good communication grounds. When a pattern of feeling unheard or unrecognized or being ignored persists over a very long time, it becomes easy to develop the perspective that our own self doesn't matter. This results in a rapid buildup of lies, leading to challenging thoughts and a weakening of our self-worth and self-esteem, which can be very hard to overcome it can make it even harder for us to reach out to others, even if it's just for a little bit of help. In the same vein, it can taint the view of others around us and the world around us, believing they cannot be able to meet our needs, that we'll never be satisfied. What we end up doing is we take things into our own hands just to fill that emptiness. Enter Abraham and Sarah. My first scripture of tonight. But out of their emptiness came the story of Hagar. And that's where I'm going to be focusing. Hagar's story is in Genesis 16, 1 to 13. NIV. <laughs> just checking. And I won't read the whole thing because there's just so much meat here. I could preach for a million years about this. But I'm going to give my emphasis and then read from Genesis 5 to 13. Amen? Amen. So, Abraham and Sarah are promised by God. They're going to have a child. They're really old. And Sarah is as barren as a desert. <laughs> so they take things into their own hands. And the result, Hagar gets pregnant. So Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham as a substitute wife. It's a common practice of that time. A married woman who could not have children was shamed by her peers and then was required to give a female servant to her husband in order to produce heirs. The children born to the servant woman were considered the children of the wife. Abraham was acting in line with the custom of the day, but his actions showed a lack of faith that God will fulfill his promise, that God would give him and Sarah a child. So now here comes Hagar, Genesis 16, 5 to 13. Brace yourselves. Then Sarai said to Abraham, their names haven't been changed yet, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering I put my slave in your arms. And now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they'll be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also told her, you are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility 
towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, our Roy. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Hagar is being mistreated by her mistress. She's not wanted to do what was asked of her. But as a slave with no rights or opinions, she had no choice. Out of desperation, she finally fled because she couldn't take the abuse and pain anymore. But she quickly found herself alone, defenseless, in the middle of a desert. To say she felt scared, lonely, and unloved is an understatement. She wondered in her despair, if anyone cared about me, does anyone notice? Can you relate to her? Perhaps not to her situation, but to the emotions that she's feeling. Fear, loneliness, feeling unloved. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your husband has left. Maybe your employer overlooks you when you work hard. Maybe you're betrayed by friends or dealing with a bit of church hurt. Maybe you feel like God sees you in a lot of areas in your life, but neglects the ones that you think matter the most. Perhaps you wondered the same as Hagar when she found herself alone in the middle of a desert. Does anyone care about me? Does anyone see what I'm going through? Perhaps you've even wondered if God cares and you've cried out multiple times. The answer to all these heart-rending questions is yes. He does, because as with Hagar, God sees you. God sees you. I want you to get that in your spirit today. When you leave this church building, that God sees me. Know that you are seen as an individual. You are known by him. He knows the very number of hairs on your head. Consider that you're worth more than all the birds in the sky. And consider that he took an intimate interest in forming you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That all his works at being you are wonderful. He loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die a horrific death for you and your sins so you can be forgiven and reconciled back to God because he desperately wants that relationship with you. Consider that you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is how much you are known by God. And not only does he know you, but he knows your name. Your name has meaning and your name has power. One of the things that struck out to me in the short passage is that every time Sarah or Abraham mentioned Hagar in their conversations, she was referred to as my slave or your slave. This leads me to conclude that she had no value in their eyes other than to be someone to be used for their selfish gain, to manipulate God's plans, to provide an heir. But when God found Hagar in the desert, the first words out of his mouth was, not addict, not single mom, not alone, not financially broken, not uneducated, not ugly, not failure, not disappointed, not overweight, But his first words were Hagar. When no one else cared enough to show Hagar any decency, God did. Up until this point in the narrative, we don't even know if Hagar knew who God was. But he certainly knew who she was. In fact, he knew her name. 
and he showed her respect by using it. And if God can see a slave lady like Hagar, how much more does he see us? How much more does he see his children? It's the same with you. God knows your name as his precious child. He knows each and every sheep by name. And not only is your name known, it is engraved on the palm of his hand. Being engraved carries a deeper implication than being written. Being engraved means it is cut, carved into God's palm, implying permanence, something that cannot be erased. Later in the story, Hagar, out of gratitude, gives God a name, which means Al Roy, the God who sees me. And the interesting fact is, Hagar is one of the very few people in the Bible, male or female, Jew or Gentile, free or slave, who names God personally. God sees your situation. Our Roy is not blind to your circumstances. Your situation has not taken him by surprise, although it might have taken you by surprise. God, being omnipresent or knowing, sees exactly what you're going through every second of the day, good or bad. Nothing escapes his eyes. Nothing escapes his attention. God sees your need. I love the fact that our Roy came to Hagar. He sought after her and arrived at the moment of her greatest need. At that moment, it was to be reassured. At that moment, it was to make her feel loved and not forgotten that she and an unborn child, a son who God named personally, yet another special blessing God showed Hagar. As the father of compassion and the God of all comfort, God soothed Hagar's worries and gave her peace to her wounded, weary heart. And as with Hagar, God also promises that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. It is during your greatest times of need that our Roy pours out his grace and mercy upon you. It's so good. (laughs) To conclude my preach, if God sees Hagar, who is regarded as a slave, how much do you think God sees us? To be seen is not just a viewpoint. It's not a ha and a goodbye. God does not just look at us, then walk away. When God sees, an action is followed. We must do the same. Our action may be different, but we must take God into our needs. We must take God into our situations. That is what makes all the difference. When we shift our perspective and allow his word to bring transformation truth to wash us, what happens? We find ourselves seen and part of something much bigger. And nothing could shake us, not even our dire circumstances. God will even use them for his great purpose.